Parker Palmer is a well-known author and educator, and in his book, Let Your Life Speak, he talks about the difference between the life that we live and the life that wants to live in us. What he means by this is that sometimes in life we will find that we make decisions about our lives that more clearly reflect our society's expectations, other people's desires for us, or even who we wish we could be, instead of who we truly are, who God has made us to be, and who God is calling us to become. To illustrate this point, he tells this story about his own life. During his tenure as dean at Pendle Hill, Parker Palmer was offered the opportunity to become president of a small educational institution. Now, he was certain this was the job for him. But, as a Quaker, he decided to go through the traditional Quaker discernment process uh, just to do things the right way. Uh, in this process, he would call together a clearness committee, and he would sit in the midi middle, and his trusted friends would form a circle around him in chairs. And they would stay there for three <coughs> hours, and during those three hours, his trusted friends would not give him any advice. But their job was to ask him open questions that would allow him to seek and know his own inner truth. Now, for a while, he writes that the questions were easy, but then someone asked, what would you like most about being president? And Parker Palmer writes, the simplicity of that question loosed me from my head and lowered me into my heart. I remember pondering for at least a full minute before I could respond. Then very softly and tentatively, I started to speak. Well, I would not like having to give up my writing and teaching. I would not like the politics of the presidency, never knowing who your real friends are. I would not like having to glad hand people I do not respect simply because they have money. Gently but firmly, the person who had posed the question interrupted and said, may I remind you that I asked what you would most like. Parker responded impatiently, yes, yes, I'm working my way toward an answer, and then resumed his sullen but honest litany. I would not like having to give up my summer vacations. I would not like having to wear a suit all the time. I would not like, but once again, the questioner called me back to the original question. But this time I felt compelled to give the only answer, answer I possessed an answer that came from the bottom of my barrel, an answer that appalled even me as I spoke it. Well, I guess what I'd like most is getting my picture in the paper with the word president underneath it, Parker <laughs> said. He continues by writing, I was sitting with seasoned Quakers who knew that though my answer was laughable, my mortal soul was clearly at stake. They did not laugh at all, but went into a long and serious silence. Finally, my questioner broke the silence with a question that cracked all of us up and cracked me open. Parker, can you think of an easier way to get your picture in the paper? <laughs> By then it was obvious, even to me, Parker writes, that my desire to be president had so much more to do with my ego and very little to do with the ecology of my life. I love the honesty and the vulnerability of this story that Parker Palmer tells that reminds us how easy it is to even deceive ourselves about who we are, who God has created us to be. He goes on to write, one crosses God by trying to be something that one is not. You see, this is the difference between the life we live and the life that wants to live in us. The life that wants to live in us is the gift that God has given us at our birth 
the gift of who we are and who God is calling us to become. This is what is being talked about in our Jeremiah passage that we read today. God is telling Jeremiah about the life that wants to live in him. About the purpose that God has created him for. Now, in the church, we call this our call. It could be our lifelong vocation, or it could be something that God has led us to do for a season, or a week, or even a day. And one of the distinctions that we make in the church when we talk about our call is that each of us have a general call and a specific call. Our general call is what all of us are called to. You'll remember the Matthew passage we read today about the two great commandments. You shall love the Lord with your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is a general call. This is not one of those places where we can say, oh, well, those people are called to love God and love neighbor, but me and these other folks over here, we don't need to do that. God wasn't really talking to us. No, this is our general call. This is a call that all of us have to love God and to love neighbor. Our specific call, well, those are things that we can say, no, you can be called to that, but that's not my call. Someone might be called to be a teacher or a doctor, or a parent, or a plumber, or a grocery clerk. It is different for each one of us, our specific call, and so it's much harder to figure out because we can't just turn to a page of the Bible and say, well, right here, this is what God says I'm supposed to do. We need to discover who God has made us to be. We need to listen to our hearts and listen to the gentle and subtle nudgings of the Spirit. So the story we read in Jeremiah this morning is about the specific call of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was called to be a prophet. Now, few of us will have that specific call, but we can learn things about God and about our specific call from taking a closer look at Jeremiah's story. First, we learn that God knows us from the very beginning, that God has a purpose for each one of us. Verse 5 reads, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. Well, this is true for all of us. God knew each one of us before we were born. And God has a purpose and a plan for each one of our lives. The second thing that we learn from this passage is that God often calls us to things that we think that we cannot do. Jeremiah's first response to God's call is by saying, Ah, oh, Lord God, truly, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. I wonder, have you ever found yourself thinking, oh, I can't do that. I can't be an elder, I don't know the Bible well enough, or I can't teach Sunday school, I, I just don't know my way around working with kids very well, or no, I don't think I'll apply for that new job, I'm sure everybody else who's applying that they have more training than I do. Well, many of us are just as good at making excuses for saying no as Jeremiah was. The other thing that we read in here is that God calls people to do things that they don't think that they're qualified for. And this is something that I've seen happen over and over. I've seen this happen in the biblical stories. I've seen this happen in my own life. And I've seen this happen in the lives of people around me. God calls us to those things that we don't think that we can do. And I don't know that I know exactly why this is, but I think a piece of it has something to do with the fact that we are more likely to ask for and to accept God's help when we're not so sure we can do it ourselves. In the next part of the scripture reading, we hear God's response to Jeremiah's worries of inadequacy. And 
I love this part. I don't know about you, but when I'm having doubts about doing something new, and I go to a friend and say, well, I've got this new opportunity and I've been thinking about it, and it might be exciting because of these reasons, but I'm just not sure, I'm not sure I, I have all the talents or skills it takes to do this. What I really want my friend to say, if my friend's going to encourage me to do this, is, why sure, of course you do. You've done this, this, and this. I think you'd be really good at this. But if you listen really closely to this story here of Jeremiah and the way God responds to his doubts, it's very similar to the way that God respond, responded to Moses' doubts. And that is, God says absolutely nothing about Jeremiah's qualifications. God merely says, I am with you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you. And this is what God says to each of us also when we are in the midst of challenges. I am with you. Do not fear. And those words are in fact much more powerful and helpful than any skill or gift that we may possess. Now it's important also to remember that God does not intend for us to say yes to every single opportunity that crosses our paths. There are certain things that God has called other people to do instead of you or me. I have some relatives and some friends who are lawyers, and boy, my eyes just cloud over when I try to read any kind of legal document. That is not my calling. I don't think that there's any amount of studying I could have done to be a good and successful lawyer. There are not things, there are certain things that each of us are not gifted in. That's why we are in community and we need one another. So we should think about, when we're tempted to say no to an opportunity, we should think about, is this because this is not who God has made us to be? Or is this fear speaking? But likewise, on the, the flip side of the coin, when we're ready to jump into a new opportunity, like Parker Palmer was in becoming president of this small educational institution, it's also good to slow down and to really examine our motivation. Now, call is not just about the big things in life. It's woven through the fabric of our lives. Martin Luther says that even changing dirty diapers can be done for the glory of God. Um, I kind of like that. I'm a little past that stage in my family, but I also wonder exactly how many dirty diapers did Martin Luther change in his life? I don't know. I'm just wondering. Brother Lawrence wrote an entire book on practicing the presence of God while doing the dinner dishes. He lived in a monastery, and it was his call to wash all of the dishes every night for dozens of months. And he writes this entire book about how he turned this monotonous task of washing dishes into this sacred call that he dedicated this work to God's glory. Now, call can also can be about something ongoing in our lives, like washing dishes or changing dirty diapers. But it can also be about what we're going to choose to do with the next hour of our lives. And I want to share a story with you about a student that um, I knew many years ago. I served a church in DeKalb, Illinois for 11 years. And uh, I have to say, when I came here last month, I just thought, this congregation reminds me so much of my congregation I served in Illinois. Uh, they, too, were in a university town. And so we had some college students, and Mary was one of the college students that came to our church regularly and was a part of our campus group. And I had known her for two or three years by the time she came to me on this particular night, and she said, Karen, guess what? Today, I ran into Nicole, my last year roommate, in the residence hall. And red flags started going off in my head because I had spent the entire previous year learning about this volatile 
explosive relationship between these two women. Um, there are very few, I've seen some really bad college roommate situations, but this is probably one of the worst I've ever seen. I think it was probably just a hard and difficult year for both of them. Um, but just the two of them did not um, get along at, at all. And so when Mary came to me and said, well, I ran into Nicole today, um, I kind of thought, ooh, I wonder how that went. Because she had said at the end of last year, I hope I never see her again. So she goes on to say that she was walking through her residence hall, and when she got down to the lobby on her way out, she had spotted Nicole over on the far side. She was at near the mailboxes. And she said the first thought that came to her mind was, I should go ask Nicole how she's doing. And then the second thought that came to her mind was, huh, that's a very strange thought. Why would I ever want to go talk to somebody that I don't even like? And she thought about that for a moment, and she thought, well, I think it's because that thought didn't originate with me. I think that's God's nudge, saying I need to go say hello to her at least. And she said she was really tempted to ignore this little nudge. Um, but she thought, you know, she, she was a good and faithful Christian, and she thought, you know what, if God's nudging me, I'm not going to say no to God. I'm just going to, it'll just take a minute. I'll just go over and I'll, I'll ask her how she's doing. And so Mary walked across the um, lobby area, and she walked up to Nicole, and she said, hi, Nicole, how are you doing? And immediately, Nicole burst into tears. And she said, I just missed the bus. And I have this really important doctor's appointment, and I can never make it there for my doctor's appointment now because I've just missed the bus. And she was um, very upset. And Mary paused for a moment, and then she said, Nicole, I have a car, and I don't have to be at class for an hour. Can I drive you to your doctor's appointment? And she did. And by that evening, when Mary was telling me that story, in all honesty, she didn't end up liking Nicole any better than she had the year before. <laughs> they just, they had too much of a history. But she was very, very grateful that God would choose to use her to help someone else, especially somebody that she wouldn't have even considered helping on her own. In my experience, God is not so much a booming voice, but gentle whispers, soft nudges, and a persistent presence. <clears throat> I want to close with one final story from Glennon Doyle. She blogs under the name Monastery, and she writes about this conversation with her daughter Tish. She writes, Last night I came into Tisha's room to kiss her goodnight and to ask about the book she was reading. She said she loved it, but she was feeling bummed because a girl in her class can read harder books. Yeah, I said, it's a bummer when people can do things that you can't do yet. I reminded her that yet is a very important word. We sat for a minute and Tish said, do you think that I'm smart? And I said, yes, I think you're super smart. But here's what I also think is true. There will always, forever and ever and ever, be someone smarter than you. And there will be someone faster than you, and funnier than you, and prettier than you, and fancier than you. But listen, here's the thing that I can promise. There will never, ever, not any time in your whole life, nowhere will you ever find someone who is tishier than you. You remember her daughter's name is Tish. You are the tishiest. No one is ever going to out-tish you. You are the only tishy that this world has got. You are the only you. Just be yourself, because that is the only thing that no one can beat you at. May we all go out into the world this week celebrating the unique, precious children of God that we have been created to be.